We're calling our present series Defining Words, focused on the maxims and the mottos that we at Tamworth Elim Church have repeatedly over the years used, which have helped to define our identity and values. These defining words are not the invention of some spin, spin doctor, nor are they merely about the past. These defining words are also about our future as we journey with God in months and years ahead. Last week, Dan started the series by reminding us that the church is the hope of the world. And it was an excellent talk, prompting us to recognise our calling as channels of hope to a world which is often without hope. Partway through his talk, Dan rather provokingly challenged us by saying, the church is the hope of the world until it's not. I found, found that to be a, an ouch moment. Essentially, Dan was saying that the church is the conduit of hope to others only when the church is truly reflecting Christ, when it is Christ-like in its actions and character. However, sadly, throughout history, there have been many examples of the church not reflecting the character of Christ. There have been many low points, and instead of bringing hope and healing, it has brought hurt and con condemnation, and also ridicule upon itself on times. And in doing so, it has become the opposite of what God called it to be. Today's defining words are belonging before believing, which is a core value at Tamworth Elim Church. There are plenty of churches that would disagree with belonging before believing and would argue that it should be the other way around, believing before belonging. Indeed, in some churches, both believing and behaving comes before belonging. The Pharisees of Jesus' time uh, who followed that order, which is why they were so scandalised by Jesus, who socialised with people they regarded as sinners. You don't know who these people are, Jesus. They are sinners. You can't eat with them. Well, over the years, I've come across many churches which embrace that kind of thinking. Essentially for them, before a person can really belong and be a part of the church community, they need to sign up to a set of beliefs and make promises to behave in a particular way before they are invited into formal membership of the church. Well, maybe that is one reason that the church has been accused of being a holy huddle, an elite group of people invested in spiritual navel gazing. Church is not an organisation that you join. It's a family where you belong, a home where you are loved and a hospital where you find healing. I came across a fictional story that made me both chuckle and wince at the same time. It tells of a man who ran to stop another man from flinging himself off a bridge into a river. The would-be rescuer asked the man, why are you killing yourself? Well, the suicidal man replied, I have nothing to live for. Don't you believe in God? Yes, I do. What a coincidence, said his would-be rescuer. So do I. Are you a Jew or Christian? I'm a Christian. What a coincidence. So am I. Are you Protestant or Catholic? Protestant. What a coincidence. So am I. Are you Anglican or Baptist? Uh, just to say at this point of the story, it's only a story and there are other brands available. Baptist, said the guy. What a coincidence. So am I. Strict and particular or general. Strict and particular. What a coincidence. So am I. Are you premillennial or amillennial? Premillennial. What a coincidence. So am I. Are you partial rapture or full rapture? Partial rapture. Well, upon hearing this, the rescuer pushed the other man into the raging river and shouted, Die, infidel. An amusing story with enough truth in it, maybe, to cause some of us to wince. One of the greatest sins 
has been to criticise its differences rather than celebrate its diversity. On many occasions, the Church of Christ has held dogmatically onto some disputable areas of theology and practice, whilst at the same time has overlooked the command to accept one another as Christ accepted us. George Verwer, the founder of Operation Mobilisation, wrote a spoof version of the hymn Onward Christian Soldiers. He called it Backward Christian Soldiers. It goes like this. Backward Christian soldiers, fleeing from the fight, with the cross of Jesus nearly out of sight. Christ, our rightful master, stands against the foe. Onward into battle, we seem afraid to go. Like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where we've often trod. We are all divided, many bodies we, very strong on doctrine, weak on charity. <laughs> Ouch, again. So why do we think it's so important to encourage belonging before believing? Well, let me offer some reasons. Belonging is important because people have been created for community. We are hardwired for connection with others and to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, especially when society has become increasingly individualistic. In our day, with our increased mobility and access to travel and instantaneous access to a world of learning and entertainment through the internet, people are both more connected and also less connected than ever before. More connected digitally, less connected in terms of real life in-person contact. Since the pandemic, even working arrangements have added to in-person isolation, with many employees working in front of a computer screen most if not all of the time throughout a week. And people were created for community. And the need to belong is an inter integral part of our psychological makeup. Secondly, belonging is important because it reflects God's heart. God is relational. We worship a triune God, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we are told that the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, even if you choose to take the creation stories of Genesis metaphorically rather than literally, as I do, the principle still stands. We're not made for isolation but we are created for community. It is not good for us to be alone. We see the relational heart of God so clearly in Christ. In the Gospels, we have Jesus calling 12 disciples to join him on a journey of discovery and exploration and friendship for the next three years. It was a voyage of ever deepening faith. And as we read the Gospels, we are shown how the disciples uh, understanding and faith grew during their time with Jesus. Those three years were an acute learning curve for the disciples. To trust the one who had the power over nature and in calming the sea and the ability to walk on water and heal the sick. They asked the question, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the question of who is this later became, you are the Christ the son of the living God. The disciples learned during those three years that the kingdom had nothing at all to do with the land of Israel. But the kingdom Jesus spoke about was not of this world, as he told Pilate. They came to see that they were agents of God's kingdom. And the means of bringing God's kingdom about on earth was not through swords and spears and military conquest, but through kindness and compassion and supporting those excluded from society, the least, the last and the lonely. They learned that the way of Christ is the way of servanthood and sacrifice. The way of Christ is always the way of the cross. And Jesus modelled the idea of belonging. He embraced people where they were at. His love was unconditional. He chose his disciples not because they believed the right things, not because they were the brightest and the best, not because they had it all together. If they needed to believe the right things before they belonged to Jesus, then none of them would have made the grade. 
it was not just the 12 original disciples, but others too. Men like Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who came to believe only after Jesus had befriended him. His change of heart came later. Again, there is an emphasis in the New Testament on belonging and community. Over 50 occasions, we find the phrase one another or each other, saying such as love one another, accept one another, bear one another's burdens, confess your sins to one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, be at peace with one another, serve one another in love, instruct one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. How are you supposed to obey those commands if you live in isolation from other Christians? And thirdly, belonging also reflects God's heart because God is gracious. What do I mean by that? Well, God accepted us and loved us before we ever loved him. God didn't love us because we loved him first or because we believed the right things about him or because we tidied up our lives and behaved in a certain way. Not at all. 1 John chapter 4. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. That sounds pretty inclusive to me. That he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. All those scriptures and many others tell us that God took the initiative in loving us first. We know that amazing truth as grace. We often speak of grace in this church and we'll speak of it, no doubt, again in this series. I'm pretty sure of that. Grace is more than a five letter word. It's more than a girl's name. It's more than a philosophical concept. It is the wonder of God's love. It is a love that is without conditions. It is unearned favour. It is God's undeserved, unjustified, unmerited, unwarranted love. Grace means that God loved us first. He took the initiative. It wasn't because of our correct beliefs or because he saw something special in us. John Pantry put it so beautifully in his song, Wonderful Grace. Wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve, pays me what Christ has earned, then lets me go free. Wonderful grace that gives me the time to change washes away the stains that once covered me. Grace, it's so wonderful. <laughs> it's amazing. It gives me what I don't deserve. If we deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. It puts to my account what Christ has earned and lets me go free. The line I saw love in that song says that this wonderful grace gives me the time to change. How wonderful is that? I've been on the journey now with Christ for 46 years and I am nowhere near the finished article. But you know that anyway. But I would also say I'm not what I once was. His grace gives me the time to change. I was invited to belong to his family long before I knew what I believed. Long before my behaviour was even remotely honouring to God. And Father God welcomed me with open arms as he does you. The Apostle Paul encouraged the church at Rome to accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. There is so much to unpack in that simple verse. Firstly, the word accepted in the Greek New Testament is stronger than our English word for accept, which is often used passively. Can I join your group? Yes, I suppose so. If you want to, We'll accept you. Well, it's much stronger than that. This word that Paul uses is far more than a cool willingness to receive someone. It means to welcome a person not only into fellowship, but into our hearts. It implies a, a warmth of kindness and genuine love. Secondly, 
The standard for accepting others is to accept others in the way that Christ accepted us. How has Christ accepted us? Was it because we are beautiful people? Because we had much to offer the church? Was it because we are the brightest and the best? I don't think so. Maybe because we were well-dressed or affluent or wealthy? No, Christ accepted us when we were still sinners. He didn't look for or expect perfection. It was when we were hostile to God and far away from him, he accepted us with no preconditions at all and despite our flaws. The picture of God's acceptance of us is vividly portrayed in the Jesus story of the prodigal son. The father's acceptance of the prodigal wasn't begrudging, it wasn't half-hearted, it wasn't indifferent, but it was enthusiastic, passionate, animated, wholehearted. Nothing else mattered to him. He wasn't even concerned with what his rebellious son had to say for himself. But it was welcome, you're home, time to party, let's get you cleaned up. And we are told to accept one another. And I think that we should keep that image of the father of the prodigal son in our minds when we think of accepting others. That is the standard that God requires. Thirdly, we are told that when we accept one another in the manner that Christ accepted us, we bring praise to God. It is God honouring action because we are reflecting the gracious heart of God who has accepted us and loved us long before we ever reached out to him. And fourthly, Belonging is important to help others encounter God. Now, most people don't just pick up a Bible one day, read it and come to faith. Some do, most don't. One key component for people who are exploring faith is that they are loved and accepted and that they are made to feel to belong. That sense of belonging provides a safe space where they can then explore their faith and experience the love of God. And that's what the Alpha Course is uh, all about. It's so wonderful. Authentic relationships are created. The Alpha videos are brilliant. It's a superb course and we are running a new course in October. So if you want to come along, we'd love to see you there. Please sign up. But the real magic is not even in the course content, as good as it is. The real magic is in the deep sense of belonging that people have, which creates a safe space for conversation and discussion authentic relationships are formed and by welcoming people with open arms into our lives and into our church we provide them with a platform a safe space for them to encounter Christ you see more people have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world and more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and ugliness of so-called Christianity than by all the doubts in the world People are generally not interested in the least by theological hair splitting. But they are concerned over the way that we invite others into our circle, the way that we treat the outsider and the way that we speak about minority groups in society. Sadly, the church is often known for what it is against or more accurately, who it is against. But genuine, authentic Christian love and the transforming presence of God in believers' lives, more than anything else, opens a person's heart to God. Tamworth Elim seeks to be a church that opens its arms wide to everyone, irrespective of race, ethnicity, social status, educational attainment, gender, sexuality or age, or even which football team you support. We are not a perfect church. We get many things wrong. But our heart is to bring healing and forgiveness and wholeness to people that this world will often reject, reject and despise. When Julie and I got married and moved into our first rented upstairs flat, it was £10 a week and it was a sea view too. Seriously. Though we did need to stand on tiptoe on the table in our front window and look over the roofs of the houses opposite us to see the sea which we just managed to glimpse we decorated the place got some furniture we scheduled time together and developed routines around our daily lives 
Our married lives of order and organisation lasted exactly 11 months to the day. And then there was David, our firstborn. All order was destroyed. Our routines were disrupted. Romantic evenings were no longer guaranteed. It's amazing how much space a little fella can take up. Nappies, pram, high chair, bouncer, all the paraphernalia. We were thankful that our carpet was brown, but on the other hand, we were not so thankful that it had deep pile. I let your imaginations run with that one. The old order and tidiness was lost. But here's the miracle. Our house became a home. When a church is inclusive, when it invites others to belong before they believe, it sometimes gets messy. But that's OK. I rather like it that way. Let me come into land by asking, did you know that there were two kinds of church? There is the church which is cold and sterile, where there isn't a thing out of place, where there are lots of decorum and dignity. It's the sort of church that's an ex exclusive club for those who are religiously inclined. So often it is. It's the sort of place that often turns people away by having an unloving attitude where people feel that they could never be good enough or that they would never be accepted. That's the kind of church that turned Mahatma Gandhi away because of the colour of his skin. Years later, he wrote, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. You Christians are so unlike your Christ. Well, the other sort of church is the inclusive church. A church which reaches out to other imperfect people. A church is, that is dynamic and full of energy and vibrant and messy. Someone once said, if it's neat, tidy, quiet and orderly that you're looking for, a graveyard is your only option. I believe that whenever a church chooses to be outward looking and inclusive, it will automatically become messier than it was before. Many of you will have heard of the Jesus people or the Jesus movement in the 1960s in America, sometimes unkindly called the Jesus Freaks. It was a movement that started in Calvary Chapel, where many young people involved in the hippie culture of sex and drugs turned to Jesus. Many of the traditional churches decided that this motley band of radicals couldn't possibly be genuinely converted. The idea of such long-haired layabouts actually being accepted by God was just a step too far for them. In the day, some churches had ushers who had been given strict instructions to refuse to let any of that sort through the doors on a Sunday morning. It can get messy. When Julie and I started a new church on a rather rough housing estate in South Wales, that was so messy too. Unexpected things can happen in your services. Like one of our new converts shouting out in praise, I effing love Jesus, he's effing wonderful. Although in fairness to him, he didn't actually say effing, he used another word. Personally, I find strong language distasteful. I don't like it. Sometimes Christians can undermine their own testimony by using choice language. But this guy was a brand new Christian from a troubled background. And he was just expressing his praise in words which he knew best. Most of those new believers couldn't spell decorum, let alone know what the word meant. I started by saying that these defining words are not the invention of some spin doctor. They are mottos and values that define Tamworth Elim Church. And my prayer is that we will continue to be conduits and channels of God's unconditional love. We will continue to include the excluded and the marginalised and provide a safe space for people who want to explore Christianity. We will allow people to belong and not expect anything from them. Just allow God's grace to give them the time to change and allow God to transform their minds and perhaps their behaviour in his time, not in ours. I pray that we will accept others as Christ accepted us and in doing so, bring honour and praise to God. God bless you. Have a great week.